Wow. I know how actors feel now. This is the third time on, on this take. The first time, I was almost done. And my son's girlfriend, Gina. I want to kick your butt, Gina. She called after he told you not to call this phone. That's all right. I love you anyway. Um, how you doing? My name's Thomas Shevlin. I'm 39 years old. Um, father of six. I got three stepchildren. Me and my wife have three kids together. Um, got a granddaughter, another grandchild coming on the way. We've been together since 1999. Today's uh, January 23rd, 2012. Um, I'm doing a video in regards to my brain cancer. You know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a cancer patient. I have brain cancer. Found out about a year ago, which is a blessing in itself. Um, and the reason I'm doing this video is because I'm getting ready to have major brain surgery, um, which is a blessing again. I'll get into a little bit of the story. Um, there was a lady I seen on YouTube when I found out about it a year ago. I was getting ready to have a biopsy, and that was a little scary. They were going to go in and take a piece out. And um, I, see, I was looking on YouTube, and I found this whole woman who was getting a craniotomy, a total resection. They were taking out the tumor and, you know, big cut and staples, you know, ugly scar. And she just made it seem like it was nothing. Blonde hair, petite woman. You know, she went into the hospital, um, showed before, showed why she was in the hospital, and then back home sitting on the couch with her kids coming and running over to her. And that was a big inspiration to me, you know. And, I mean, if she could do it, and, um, I could do it. You know, um, tell you a little bit about my experience with cancer, the things I know. Um, if I knew a year ago what I know today, I wouldn't have went through such a roller coaster. So hopefully, some of the things I'm about to say will help anybody going through this. Um, I found out in a car accident. They told me I was lucky. They found it early. Um, they said they seen something on my brain um, that I should go to a neurologist. I didn't even know what a neurologist was at the time. Uh, my wife did. Um, went to a neurologist. They got me an MRI. Came back. I had a tumor. Um, I remember him saying, you know, oh, you know, 10 years ago this would be a death penalty for you, but uh, this will be a death sentence. Death penalty. She was a death sentence. But you know, the way things changed, you know, this is fine. Not no worry about. It. You're gonna live a long time. Um, so then, uh, you know, I wanted to go to Sloan Kettering. Uh, my coverage wasn't good enough for that. Um, I got I got nobody else to blame for that. You know, hey, you know, every once in a while I get a little mad. You know, why can't I get the best medical treatment? But the truth is. You know, it has nothing to do with being poor. I made a lot of bad decisions in my life, you know, and I'm right where I'm supposed to be, you know, um, and, and I'm blessed, again, in a lot of ways. So I ended up uh, Mount Sinai accept, accepting my coverage. I went down there, my parents, my wife, one of my good friends, Chris, my aunt, they all went down there, and uh, we're sitting there with this big neurologist, and he tells me, oh, don't worry about nothing. You got. To, we don't know how long brain tumors, you know, begin. It's not really affecting you in any major way, and just go home and live your life for 20, 25 years, once a year, get an MRI and see if it's getting bad. <laughs> but, just to be safe, let me get an MRI done on you, come back in a week or two. I live over two hours away, but I go back in a week or two, I'll get it done. They call me back a week later, hey, um, yeah, it is definitely a tumor, and we think we want you to um, have a consultation with our brain surgeon, neuro-oncologist surgeon. Neurologist, obviously the brain, oncologist, cancer, surgeon, she does the operations. I went in there, she suggested that we do a biopsy, um, which is where they go in, almost like with a robot type of dome thing, and they take a little piece out, she explained like little pieces of rice, and um, they're able to tell if it's cancer or not. Uh, benign or malignant, is the way I should have worded it. Um, <laughs> anyway, I do that. Um, go a little nuts after the procedure on a lot of steroids to keep the swelling down that and all the type of medications they put me on they find out that I have seizures because the tumor is messing up my transmitters or receptors and I don't have um, grandma seizures I don't you know fall on the ground and flop um, you know, thank God you know I'd hate for my kids to see that um, I have focal seizures um, I could be talking to you maybe end up doing it in this video just talking in days out <laughs> hopefully I don't um, and uh, you know just lose focus um, and I also found out lately that I have seizures in my sleep often and severe sleep apnea um, but anyway I do the biopsy I go back two weeks later now in this process you know Facebook is big you know it's 2012 I have Facebook uh, come from a big Irish Italian family Bay Ridge Brooklyn you know and uh, you know hey yo it's me Tommy what's up fellas but anyway uh, I uh, in, in, in this time you know, I posted it on Facebook, you know, because I, the first couple of days telling people, talking to people about it, I went on the phone for hours. You know, I got seven brothers and sisters, there's seven of us, you know, so, anyway, long story short, I posted it on Facebook, got a lot of prayers, a lot of, um, 
you know, support and, and a lot of friends, you know, that I didn't even know, you know, cared about me that much, you know, got in touch with me and said a lot of good things and made me feel really good. I, I go back for the results of the biopsy and uh, it's a Friday and uh, she's reading all this, you know, medical mumbo jumbo, you know. I got, you know, I, I got a 12th grade reading level. I graduated high school, well, my GED, and I went to college for a year. So, you know, I, I'm not, I you know, I can read and write, you know. And I, I just said to her, I said, Doc, just tell me, is it cancer or no? And she said, no, it's not cancer. I fell on the floor, my aunt was crying, my cousin was crying, my cousin Angela, my Aunt Barbara were there with me. I got up, I said, Aunt Barbara, I said, you, uh, make the, she wanted me to see a, a, a tumor specialist on Monday at Mount Sinai. I said, you make the appointment, I'll be back Monday. So I'll spend the weekend down here with you. And uh, I walked out the building, I went out the building, and uh, you know, I'm in the middle of Manhattan, grew up in Brooklyn, don't really know a lot of people in Manhattan. And, one of the kids I grew up with just happened to be, you know, on a job right there. I see him. What's up, Keith? And, uh, you know, I spent some time. I was, you know, choked up, a little TMI. You know, I'm going to be around longer. I could be, you know, make, make some, fix some of the mistakes I made as a dad and all the things that I was regretting at the time. And, you know, I'm going to do the right thing. And, um, you know, it was really great. It was a good feeling. I go home. I post on Facebook. You know, great news. It's, you know, I have a tumor. It's cancer. It's not cancer. <coughs> you know, I still got a rough road ahead of you. You know, even just a brain tumor is, you know, tough. And um, got a rough road ahead of me, but you know it's not cancer, and it's a blessing. You know, a lot of again, you know, a lot of friends, family. So anyway, that Monday I go, and um, I'm in the Ruttenberg Center in Mount Sinai Hospital. And in the Ruttenberg Center, it's like you know, nice little area. I should have known something was up when they had like all the free stuff out. You know, cookies and drinks and sodas and snacks just for free in the middle of a doctor's office. And my aunt was with me. My aunt decided at the last minute to go with me. Thank God, because most people would have thought I was crazy. And um, my aunt comes to me, and as I was sitting there, my aunt Barbara says, she says, Tommy, she says, uh, I just lost an aunt, you know, her sister, my mom's sister, and my, you know, my aunt Barbara's sister, and they were, her and my aunt Mary were really close, and she went to the doctors and everything throughout her, her, her cancer with her every time, and my aunt Barbara says to me, this feels like, you know, the, the type of waiting room I was in with your aunt Mary the whole time. You know, they're giving out free stuff, and, you know, I can tell who's on, on treatments and all this other stuff, and. That's odd. I guess they put you in the same place as cancer patients for your tumor. Anyway, long story short, I go in, I meet the doctor. He's a nice doctor. Uh, spends a lot of time with me. Um, explains to me, you know, I have seizures. Um, um, actually, I, I had a seizure right in front of him in the office. You know, my aunt was like, are you crazy? And then, you know, when he said to him, ma'am, you know, it's, you know, 68 degrees in my office, looking at him, he's sweating red in the face, and he just stopped answering us for two minutes. I think, you know, doesn't it make sense? So I have these focal seizures and uh, also, uh, uh, I think I said it earlier, seizures in my sleep. Anyway, you know, it's 45 minutes, we're talking, all this other stuff, you know, what we could do. And then all of a sudden, well, I, you know, I said, so what, what are we going to do? And he says, well, we're going to wait for it to get aggressive. And at that point, you know, after spending hours upon hours on the computer in those first couple of weeks, I knew aggressive, you know, I says, not bigger, not wait for the tumor to get bigger. He said, aggressive. I says, what do you mean aggressive? He says, you know, for the cancer to start spreading. I said, what do you mean cancer to start spreading? Doc, you know, I try not to use the doctor's names in the video. The doctor, you know, the doctor said I didn't have cancer the other day. No, no, no. Oh, I know what it is. Some doctors don't feel it's cancer if it's not metastasizing, if it's not spreading throughout your brain, it's not spider webbing. They won't call it cancer until it's starting to spread and, and then it's going to kill you. That didn't make sense to me. Now I just found out my aunt's face. You should see my aunt's face and I, I, I you know, I wish I could see my face, you know, when I looked at her. It was devastating, you know. Um, after all, you know, that month and a half, everything I had been through, you know. So, you know, I, you know, I talk to people, we're going to sue her, this, this, and that. I, I want to live. I don't care about suing, you know, at this point. I mean, I could always use a couple million dollars, you know, if a lawyer sees this and he thinks he can get me some money, you know, she deserves it. No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. But anyway, um, I, uh, I call her. And she calls me back a few hours later at my aunt's after I leave the doctor's office. And uh, I say, you know, you told me it was a cancer. She said, well, you know, she must have already talked to the doctor. I, I don't really don't consider it cancer until it's getting aggressive and starts spreading. But you didn't ask me if it was benign or malignant. Wasn't that your job to tell me? I'm supposed to tell you? I'm supposed to have to ask you a question? You were supposed to tell me what type of tumor I had. You just did an operation on my head. Anyway, I moved on from that. Um, in the visit with that doctor, though, he told me I had a rare brain, cancerous brain tumor. It was an oligodendroglioma. <coughs> um, and I was lucky they found it early, but they weren't going to do nothing until it got bad. <laughs> so, you know, explain how I'm lucky. Uh, 
well, I do realize a little later on how lucky I am, but that has nothing to do with medical. Um, anyway, uh, that this type of tumor does react to chemotherapy, but it is inoperable because where it's located in my brain, in my front left lobe, it's too close to my motor skills. You know, everybody has their motor skills. I find out later, not everybody. But everybody has their motor skills on the left side of their brain, typically. And my, my tumor's right there. So they can't operate on it. Um, but the good thing is most people with an astrocytoma, which is the main brain tumor, um, tend to, tend to you know, uh, be more of a terminal, quicker terminal brain, brain tumor because brain cancer is pretty much terminal, you know. Uh, it's always going to go back. It's just some some of us get lucky. Some of us don't. It could be years or not. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, I just didn't, you know, upset you in any way. But it's just the truth, you know. The roots are embedded in your brain, and they can't always get the roots out. But anyway, but that chemotherapy working this. So now i got a couple of chemotherapy treatments and then radiation. But radiation in the brain is bad, especially for a young person, because you could lose, a, it could hurt a lot of good cells and stuff, too. But that's the last resort. So, you know, with everything I'm researching, shoot, chemo, you know, when it gets aggressive, he's telling me it's three to five years before they even have to treat it. And, you know, I'm like, whatever they I found out, that's a blessing. Three to five years before it even starts to affect me. Yeah, all right, I am blessed. So, you know, I go back and forth a couple times every 60 days, get an MRI, check if it's aggressive, you know, and just kind of deal with it and moved on with life. Um, I didn't move on so well. I had a... A tough month and a half period from like uh, probably I'd say from May to, to the middle of June um, between the steroids and you know not dealing with it right or you know, keeping it to myself or whatever it was the old road co roller coaster um, went through a bad experience and you know was starting to affect my family my wife and their kids and I had to make a decision you know and the decision for me was am I gonna deal with this or am I just gonna sit back and let it happen you know uh, and uh, you know I love my kids I love my wife and I chose I chose to deal with this you know uh, every day on a daily basis live li li live like I'm blessed be the best person I can be uh, which I'm always not always already you know <laughs> um, as crazy as that sounds but uh, I do feel blessed every time I feel down I realize I'm blessed um, but anyway so I'm going back and forth now my wife comes with him once and she meets him for the first time after my third visit, and he's talking to me, and he's being a little, little, um, like his, his, his tone changed, and just everything about him, like he didn't even know who I was, you know, and, uh, my wife says, oh, well, the good thing is, you know, five years from now, when, like the doctor said, it gets aggressive, you don't know what they're going to find out there, and he said, ma'am, you know, I'll be honest with you, don't get your hopes up, they don't spend a lot of research on brain cancer, it's not the typical biggest cancer killer, you know, like prostate and breast cancer and all this other stuff. Um, not much funding goes to brain cancer, so I don't think she, things are going to change that much in the next five years. Real nice of them, right? My wife cried in the car the whole way home. So when I started realizing, like, wow, you know? Now, I've always kind of trusted doctors. Not the type, you know, a lot of people say they're scared to go to the doctors. It's scared to get bad news, but in my opinion, God wouldn't have created, you know, let us find this knowledge to not use it, you know? Um, and, and God, you know, so I've always, you know, I'm not one of those, you know, don't keep me alive, uh, you know, do not resuscitate and all that. If they can keep me alive and keep me resuscitated and there's a little chance that I might fight back, keep doing it, you know. And I believe in doctors. I don't think God would have let us found, you know, all these medical miracles and stuff like that without doctors, you know, um, <coughs> if he didn't want us to, to use them. Um, anyway, you know, I'm rambling on. Anyway, um, I, go, I go back. I, I, I had an appointment in this past September and I postponed it to October and I go back um, in October months ago. I sit down and, you know, the nurse usually comes in and asks me a bunch of questions. How you doing? How you taking your medicine? All this other stuff. You know, my season medicine, all that other stuff. And, uh, he comes in and he goes, listen, you know, he sits on his little chair and he got his computer on and he goes over to me and he goes, you know, I think it's time that we start considering we do ra you taking your uh, radiation treatments. Radiation treatments? What do you mean? The chemo? Are you going to give me the temodozo te pill? Whatever it is that, you know, supposedly he's working? No, 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 you, you, the chemo won't work with you. I said, what are you talking about? You're the one that said that chemo works in oligodendrogloma. You don't have an oligodendrogloma, you have an astrocytoma. I was like, what? Now, I do remember when they did the procedure, after I got the re initial results, they said they were they're waiting on some more pathology reports that'll be in a few weeks later. They got those reports and never told me. I was there two more times after that, and they didn't realize, they didn't even tell me that the possibility was it wasn't an oligodendrogloma. 
I was like, wow. So he sits back and he thinks he told me that it was a natural cytoma and, he, you know, make it seem like I'm an idiot. No, Thomas, uh, you know, the chemo don't work on this. You know that already. I'm like, ah, doc, you know, you never told me I have a natural cytoma, you know. And he's looking at the computer and I think he realized his mistake. He says, well, you need to start considering doing radiation because you have a natural cytoma. And he gets up, he goes, I'll be right back. And they all leave. And two minutes later, after telling me I need to start considering radiation, and I said, well, I'm going to have to talk to my wife tonight and stuff. They give me a card and they say, come back in four months. You just told me I need to consider radiation. Now you tell me to come back in four months? What are you doing to me? I didn't say nothing. Non-confrontational. I trusted the doctor. I went home. I didn't tell my wife for a day or two. I was depressed. I was like, are you kidding me? And um, try not to blame this on anybody else. You know, because life and it really is nobody else's fault. It is what it is. And um, my wife got pissed. My wife got pissed. She's Italian from the Bronx, you know. So she got pissed and uh, she, spent, she spent the next two days on the computer. And... Um, Sloan Kettering, John Hopkins, the cancer commercials, the cancer commercials, you guys are very misleading, cancer commercials. You guys aren't that nice. As soon as you found out that I didn't have that good of coverage, you guys didn't even want to talk to her. You were very rude to my wife, too, uh, at three different of your locations throughout the country. As soon as my wife, you guys found out our medical coverage, you guys didn't even want to talk to her no more. No, no suggestions, no nothing. Rude as hell. Not nice. That's on you, though. Anyway, um... My wife somehow, we were talking about this the other day, she don't even know how, she found some woman who called her back, who referred her to the National Institute of Health. Now if you guys don't know who the National Institute of Health is, it's the National Institute of Health is in Bethesda, Maryland, right by Washington, D.C., and it's where 25% of the American medical research money goes. So I didn't know a lot at the time, I remember I was laying in bed and I was depressed, she told me all excited, she spoke to this lady, and... She called, and they were going to call her back if I fit the bill for clinical studies. So I didn't really, you know, get excited enough that I was like, yeah, at this point, I was like, there ain't nothing they can do for me, you know? And it's just a matter of time. And she came in, she was like, they want to talk to you. And I went out, and I answered a couple questions, and, all right, we're going to call you back, and, um, you know, we're going to put this through and see if you can get approved. And, you know, we're thinking weeks. They called us back an hour later and gave us an appointment. And told us they would reimburse me for my money for going down there if they decide they want to, you know, accept me as a clinical study. So, you know, two weeks later we were on our way there. You know, now I started doing some research, and they do a lot of clinical studies, and you know, on their page you can't really, you know, unless you're a doctor. You know, I was hitting the research things. I was like, what kind of research do they do? I didn't know. I didn't know if I was going to go there and they were going to stick a toothpick in it, and that was some new study. I didn't know if they were, you know. Uh, you know, we're gonna gonna, gonna put a piece of diamond in. I didn't I didn't know what they were gonna do, but I knew that it was inoperable. <laughs> I knew chemo didn't work, and I was willing to try anything before the radiation. I want to I want to live, you know. And you know, unfortunately, cancer. When you die of cancer, you know, I see my aunt. It was sad, and uh, you know, I hate to know that one day my family's gonna have to go through that, you know. Um, but I want to live, you know. But I want to live. All right. I don't want to live in a bed, you know, where they got to clean me and all that other stuff for, for years, you know, uh, and take care of me and all that other stuff. I don't want to put them through that. I want a couple of good years, you know, physically and everything. I want to go to my kids' ball game and still be their coach and, you know, do all the stuff and go to parties and be happy and, you know. Um, and it's been like that for the last year, you know, through a lot of family and friends and, you know, Judy, my wife's best friend, and uh, you know, even my mother-in-law has been great, my brother-in-law, Rock and Steve, and you know, my family and all my friends, you know, um, a, lot of, a lot of my friends from Brooklyn I haven't seen for years stepped up, you know, I love you guys, thank you, and a lot of my friends that, that from Brooklyn that I grew up with that, you know, been in my life for years, you know, I love you guys too, thank you for all the support, and just my family and everybody, you know, all the love, but anyway, um, uh, I kind of jumped around, um, trying to try stay focused, I go down there, and the first thing they do when they, they you know, they, they explain to me, I'm going to see it, I'm going to, I'm going to do an MRI, I'm going to see a, um, um, a doctor's physician, uh, assistant, uh, uh, or a neurologist's physician, uh, assistant, um, which is some form of a doctor, um, very nice lady, and then I would see the doctor, and that I could stay there as many hours as I wanted to, ask some questions until I leave knowing, if nothing else, exactly what's wrong with me, and what type of, you know, anything happens, and what are my options. And they said that's the biggest thing that they want to do. Um, anyway, it's a government facility. They, they, they do take clinical studies on brain cancer. Um, they explained to me earlier on if it was prostate cancer, if it was breast cancer. 
there's tons of cases of that. So unfortunately, you know, for those people, they don't. It's hard to get accepted for clinical studies for that. Um, but brain cancer is kind of rare, so it's a little easier to get accepted for brain cancer. So that was a blessing. Um, they don't advertise. You know, this is the advertise of me right now. You know, if you know someone with brain cancer. Uh, I suggest you get in touch with them. If nothing else, go find out. You know, find out if you, it's a second opinion. Uh, they know what they're talking about. There, they got some great doctors there. Um, they're gonna, they're gonna spend time with you. Uh, they might tell you something that you didn't already know. That you know, they, they don't treat you like a number. They already got their set salary. They don't have to worry about insurances and and bills being paid and overhead and you know what coverage they got to accept and all that other stuff. You know, it's the blessing. Um, but anyway, in the conversation, you know, I meet this Dr. Sue. I hate using names, but um, she's, a, she's been a blessing. Uh, we spent a lot of time. She explains to me about my seizures. And she explains to me that, and they don't like, doctors don't like talking bad about each other, but she just wanted to be straight up with me. She explained to me that Mount Sinai shouldn't have diagnosed me, first of all, because when they did the biopsy, they didn't even take enough out to really be able to tell if it's an oligodendrogoma or an astrocytoma. With the specimen that they did, it was too small, and they would have to check chromosomes because chromosomes have something to do with determining if it's an oligodendrogloma as opposed to an astrocytoma. So really for them to diagnose me, they might have to later on give me a biopsy if I, at my will, if I was willing or if they accepted me as a clinical study. Then I went on to explain, you know, well if it's an oligo, yeah, uh, some, some forms of chemo work, but if it's an astro, it's pretty much radiation and based on all the reports and MRIs, obviously this is an inoperable tumor. Um, taking out is the best thing, you know. Um, doesn't always, they can't take it all out. They say, some doctors say they do, but you know, they stay in the roots. But anyway, and then she went on to explain that 90% 90, 90 of the you know, people in the world, their motor skills in that area where my tumor is are right there. So when she said 90%, that's the first time I ever heard that. I said, well, what's the other 10%? She said, well, through studies, we found out that 10% of the left handers are typically could have their motor skills on both sides or on the right side. But you're not left-handed, she said to me. I said, yes, I am. She said, you're left-handed? I said, absolutely. She says, it's not in none of the reports. Nobody asked you that before? None of the doctors asked you if you were left-handed? I was like, no. She's like, wow. Now that gave me hope. So anyway, <laughs> she said she'd get in touch with us. She was going to sit with the tumor board, see if it was worth doing the biopsy to, send to, to have their pathologist look at it and then discuss possibly in the biopsy seeing, give me a procedure where I'm awake, seeing if the motor skills are in that area or both sides, or if I get lucky and I'm one of the left-handed, few people left-handed where the motor skills are on the other side or both sides. So, you know, it was right around Christmas time, you know, we just got back right before Christmas and we were down there for a couple of days and our friend Judy came with us and uh, we love you, Jude. And um, my wife is out Christmas shopping, you know, and I was sitting at home, and the kids just got home from school, and um, you know she was with Judy, and she was with my daughter Denise, and a friend of ours, Matt. And I get a phone call, private number, and it's it's the doctor from National Institutes of Health's private cell phone number. That's why I was private. She called me from a cell phone, very excited. And what happened was they have a tumor board of about 20 doctors, I believe, and they look at all the MRIs for the last year or two. And she was like, Thomas? And I was like, yeah, can I speak to Tom Shepard? I said, yeah, this is Tom. Who's this? Hey, Tom, this is Dr. Sue. I was like, wow, that was pretty quick. It's only a couple of days later. I was like, all right, you know. I was waiting. She was like, listen, Thomas, um, we got what we really believe is some really good news. And I was like, what do you mean? Now, I, I thought she was going to tell me I was accepted for the clinical studies, and they were going to do a biopsy so they know how to see if I could get chemo because we knew we couldn't take it out, right? And... And, and my son's checking because if this thing shuts up again, I'm done. Now let me hurry up, actually. Anyway, and she says, no, 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 Thomas. We looked at all the MRIs, and all of us agree, not honestly, that we could take this tumor out without even worrying about your motor skills. It's not exactly near that. And I was like, what? In my opinion, and hopefully, that just added years of my life. Not only that, I end up speaking a few days later to the physician, um... Harvard graduate since 1985 um, who's going to be doing the procedure and he says, you know, Thomas, don't worry about it. I do 100 of these a year as opposed to the couple they do at Mount Sinai that one surgeon. And he said it's nowhere near the motor scale or else we wouldn't be doing this. We wouldn't take a chance. 
and he went on to explain some stuff and through the procedure where it is located it could affect me a little bit it could leave me um slightly paralyzed for a couple of days a couple of weeks a couple of months um on one side uh, which is a little scary um and uh anyway um you know i called my wife i couldn't believe that i mean he went on to explain that not only could they do it once if it grows back again in the same area a few years from now a few months whatever that they could take it out again and take it out again this just added many many years to my life and that's a blessing and how i look at this is i called my wife they were they were shopping at walmart you know <laughs> and i was at her was screaming crying and celebrating and um That was a big relief for her. You know, um, she's been my, my blessing, you know. Um, even though I don't always let her know it. I'm a big Irish thug from Brooklyn, you know. I mean, you know from, I'm not, you know, I'm a hopeless romantic, you know. But anyway, I do love my wife and kids, and she knows it. Um, set up the procedure, and um, got to see the Giants beat the 49ers. I think I said that earlier. I don't know. I, this is my third recording. I'm kind of all over the place. What a great game. Um, I'm about to, I've been, I cut my own kid's hair, you know, my stepson Danny's 19, I've been cutting his hair since he was 6, always complaining I was too tough, and always just yelling, shut up, you know, I want them to look good, you know, um, so I couldn't afford to get them all haircuts all the time, so now my, uh, my, the three boys we have together, Tommy Jr., you know, I have, I have Nicole, my older stepdaughter, Denise, and Danny, well, I've been with their mom since 1999, we've been raising them together, I love them just like they're my own, then we have Tommy Jr., TJ, um, he calls himself Casey, a boy, uh, a little ginger, a little redhead, and then Noah, and um, I've been cutting all their hairs for a few years, and um, being that I'm going to get this big procedure in, in a few days, I'm getting ready to go to Maryland, um, and um, you know, I'm a little nervous, but I'm, I'm not scared, a little anxious, I'll probably have a little bit of a panic attack like I did last time just to go under the knife, but I'm not scared, um, but I'm going to let them cut my hair at the end of this video, I'm going to let you guys see that. Now they're all excited waiting upstairs, but uh, I want to explain a little bit about that, about not being scared, and and how this is a blessing. You know, some people just die. You know, and it's sad. Some people die in their sleep, a heart attack. Some people die in an accident. Some people get killed. Some people get sick and just immediately die. <coughs> and what's the first thing everybody says? I didn't get to say goodbye. I didn't get to tell them I love them. A lot of people told me they loved me in the last year. And I got to tell and show a lot of people I love them. I had the best summer of my life. And um, again, Judy, thank you. You know, um, I kind of isolated from a lot of friends and family that stepped up in the beginning. Um, more than anything, I think it was the embarrassment of initially putting on Facebook I had cancer and then I didn't and then I had, did. I was embarrassing, you know, as opposed to you know finding out I had cancer. I was hiding from that for a while. I was like, holy shit, it seems like I'm, you know, begging people for help or something. Um, it's people watching this video. They ain't not one of you that could say I called you up and asked you for help. A couple of people did help us out. I'm on disability and we ain't making a lot of money and you know, times are hard and um, I didn't want no help. I told everybody from the beginning. When things get really bad, if someone wants to step, step up and help my family out, you know, I'll gladly accept it. If someone does something honestly, I'm not gonna turn it down, you know what I'm saying? But other than that, you know, I don't you know, I didn't do this this ain't about help. You know? Um, I wanna live. You know, I want to be a good dad. You know, like this summer, my kids play baseball, all-star teams, travel, then football on a traveling team. Great, three different teams, six days a week, six hours a day at the football field, from July all the way to November. I mean, it was great. Then right into basketball now. You know, life is good, man. You know, I want to live. You know, um, but I'm not scared. I'm not scared for a couple different reasons. And one of them is, you know, if you know me, I uh. I probably shouldn't be alive. There's a lot of people I know or have known in my life that went through a lot worse things than me or ain't here no longer and didn't do half the things I did. I made a lot of really bad, bad decisions growing up in, in various Brooklyn, New York. Um, I thought the world owed me something. I was angry. I, you know, I didn't have the best upbringing, you know, greatest childhood. We weren't rich. I always uh, felt different. always wanted more than I had. Um, and was willing to do anything to do it. Uh, had a lot of experience with you know, drugs and alcohol and uh, being incarcerated at a young age. 
1999, you know, I was trying for a lot of years to get out of that circle, and I would always just, you know, do something stupid to get myself, you know, in handcuffs and have to get bailed out, or, you know, but I pretty much stopped going in and out of prison in 1999. I met my wife, thank God, and I haven't had handcuffs pretty much on me since then. Um, I had my kids, you know, it was a blessing. And it changed my life. And um, up until 1999, I had a fear of impending doom. I always thought something bad was going to happen. And I almost didn't care. It was like a joke. And um, I was waiting for it to happen. I was prepared. I was like, whatever. My wife and my kids changed my bottom. They made me love and feel. And, um, a lot of friends. There was a lot of good people in my life growing up, too, that, you know, even though I, was, I, I probably wouldn't want to have one at points in my life, didn't want, wouldn't have wanted to hang out with my own self. You know, it's sad. My own brother told me that once. You know, if you weren't my brother, I wouldn't be friends with you. Um, I was hurt at the time, but it was the truth. You know, um, you pick your friends, you can't pick your family, right? Um, but he's still in my life, and I love him. You know, he's been a big inspiration for me. Um, but the blessing is, I always had that fear of a pending doom, even for my kids and me afterwards. I was waiting for this day. You know, and um, some people just die quick. They don't get to say goodbye. You know. I have this opportunity, and now I have another blessing, you know, and I'm going to be able to say goodbye, you know, and even, God forbid, if something happens to me with this procedure, you know, I got the joy of raising three kids that weren't mine, that love me to death, and I love them. <laughs> Hold on, come back in two minutes. <laughs> I got the joy of uh, having three beautiful kids with my wife. I had the joy of being in love with my wife, being with her for this long. I uh, had a beautiful granddaughter, a beautiful grandson on the way. Unexpected, but that's all right. Hopefully they're going to name him Peyton. I love that name. And um, the fear of impending doom don't scare me no more. I'm not worried about that. You know? I'm not waiting for that bad thing to happen, before all that calm and all those bad things I did. Since I've been with my wife, I had an opportunity to make some amends and do some really good things in life. Um, and just be a good person. And it wasn't easy. You know, I had inspirations, I had a lot of help, a lot of good people in my life, you know who you are. And, um, you know, this same thing happens to, this, this, this disease is not, it's not prejudice. It happens to good people, it happens to bad people. You know, it is what it is. Like I said, you know, I had a great life, you know. Um, it would have been sad for me, looking on the outside, looking in, to have died before 1999. I was angry, immature, selfish, unhappy person. These freaking 12, almost 13 years, whatever it was, 12 years. I've, if someone would have told me in 1999 I was going to have the next 12 years, and it always hasn't been, you know, great. Financially, that's all I worry about is finances. I'm a man, you know. Um, hasn't always been great, but when you look at it, when you a month or two later, when you're telling that story about that night that you're so pissed off about, but you laugh about it then, those those holidays where you're worried, you know, you couldn't even get your kid a gift, but you get them something they actually like it, or just you know the the nights where you watch a movie or just tickled your kids, or or you know you have a stupid fight and realize it was stupid, and you know you're laying next to each other and say you know you hug each other and say that it's gonna be all right. I had, I had those opportunities. People don't get those opportunities. Not not people that did the things I did, hung out with the people I hung out with, and ended up the places I ended up with in my life. A lot of those people don't have the opportunity. And a lot of people that didn't do the things I did didn't have the opportunity. So I, I've been blessed, you know, and um, I, I had an opportunity to really live life. You know, I want to live longer. I want to live for another 30 years. But, you know, it is what it is. If my purpose, because I believe I had a purpose, you know, he kept me around for a reason. When, you know, he took better people than me before me, he kept me around for a reason. If my purpose is served, hopefully it's a really great purpose. If it was all about this, it was, if it was, if it was just to take this tomb out because it's going to help, eventually you find, you know, because that, uh, that's what I agreed, you know, it'll be a clinical study. It's going to help find, you know, uh, some uh, you know to save someone else's life later on, or to find a cure, then that's what I've been around all this time for, and I'm content with that. Again, I'm sure my kids want me to be around a lot longer. I want to be around a lot longer. 
I want a, I want a couple million dollars. I want this. I want that. But no matter what, you know, I'm happy. Anyway, let's not, you know, be all, get it all sad and everything. Hopefully, I wasn't jumping all over the place, confusing people. And um, I'm going to go upstairs now. I'm going to let my kids cut my hair. All right, yo. Love, peace, and hair grease. People out there know I love you. I, I ain't mad at nobody. I got no anger towards anybody in this world. I want everybody to be happy. And I love you guys. Hold on. See you sitting there listening to Joe. No, I was watching TV.